Well, as some of you saw, we have uh, Mexico flashbacks tonight in the downtown campus. It's where we celebrate all that God did on our Mexico trip uh, with the high school students. We took about 70, uh, 80 of them down there, and uh, I think some of you uh, have heard some of my stories about that. But on that trip, I hardly got any sleep. I mean, I feel like I'm still recovering, you know? And one of the reasons for this is because I stayed in a, a room of high school guys. No, enough said, right? I mean... It was crazy. Our room was a disaster. Mountains of dirty clothes, partially inflated air mattresses, um, used baby wipes, half-eaten bags of chips, right? You get the picture. Nasty. This is nasty room. But believe it or not, something good came out of this den of depravity, okay? And it was lots of good, deep conversations. That's why I wasn't sleeping, probably. And one night, Tuesday night, one of the guys started a discussion that I've heard many times before. He said this, it seems to me like the God in the Old Testament is angry and wrathful, where in the New Testament, he's forgiving and loving. Who's ever thought that or heard that before? A few of us. If you spent any time in the Bible, you begin to get the sense that God in the Old Testament is a little more grumpy. Speaking of grumpy, check out what atheist Richard Dawkins has to say about God in the Old Testament. He's one of the new atheists. He says this, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent, bully, You don't have to know what those words mean to know they're not good, right? (laughs) Yeah, I'm not comfortable with them. That's right. And, uh, you know, tell us what you really think, Richard. Um, And we probably don't agree with him if you're in church today. Uh, You might. I don't know. Um, But um, interestingly enough, this view is not actually new. In the second century, there was a theologian named Marcion, and he taught the same thing. I think there's a picture of uh, him on there. I mean, not like a real picture, but, you know, they didn't have cameras back then. But um, unlike Dawkins, Marcion actually believed that the Old Testament God was a different God. So, for example, he, he taught that the God of Israel was one God, and the father of Jesus was a different God. The God of Israel in the Old Testament, he's a big jerk. Angry, wrathful, primitive, murderous. But the father of Jesus, the New Testament God, he's all-forgiving, all-loving, the greater God. Obviously, Marcion's teachings were countered and condemned by the early church, and the controversy actually sped up the formation of what we call the Bible today. They had to get it uh, established because Marcion wanted to cut out the whole Old Testament. And, uh, you know, so that's a little bit of a rabbit hole, but while we might not agree with Dawkins or Marcion, most of us have probably experienced that sense of unease when we read the Old Testament. Right in the New Testament, we like it when Jesus says to love our enemies, but when we read about floods, f- fires, and plagues from heaven, uh, it tweaks us a little bit. But I disagree with Marcion and Dawkins and my high school friend, uh, because when you read the Old Testament more carefully, you see a God who is incredibly patient. His steadfast love is mentioned 196 times in the Old Testament. A great example of this is in the book of Judges. That's the book with Samson in it, the big strong guy. Uh, In this book, it's actually very pessimistic. A cycle repeats itself. The people forget about God. They worship idols. They get taken over by foreigners. They beg God to come rescue them. God comes and rescues them. They get prideful. The process repeats itself over and over and over again. By the third time, if I'm God, I'm done. I'm done with Israel, but he continues with them. He's more forgiving, more loving, more patient than I could ever be. In fact, by the time you get to 2 Kings, the fact that the nation gets carted off to Babylonian exile, punishment, it's no surprise. It's been a long time coming. And so we need to read the Old Testament more carefully. But it's also true of the New Testament. When we hear things like the New Testament is just about a God of love, this oversimplifies things. God isn't just a big jerk in the Old Testament. And he's not just a big teddy bear in the New Testament. 
All right? There's, uh, it's more complicated than that. We are dealing with God. And we'll especially see this in our story today, and it's probably going to make you uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable this week. But hang with me. So uh, we're going to start in Acts 4, 36, but pretty much go to uh, chapter 5, Acts 4, 36, and uh, this is going to be on the screen. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest of it and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Did it not belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. A great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me this. Is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? She said, yes, this is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the men of the feet who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. No kidding. Right? <laughs> this is God's word, as uncomfortable as it might be. All right, so let's talk about the problem, the parallel, and the purpose. First, the problem. Uh, this new Christian community, they're taking care of their poor members. Rich, poor, slave, free, male, female, they're all together taking care of the poor members. And some of the rich people actually decide to sell the land they don't need. One of these guys, Barnabas, we'll talk about him in a few weeks, he, he sets the stage. He, he sells a piece of his property and gives the money to the, the apostles for the poor. Ananias and Sapphira follow his lead. They're a couple, a married couple, and they sell a piece of property, and they act like they're going to give the entirety of the money to uh, the poor, and then they die. If we're honest, this seems a little extreme. Right? Ananias and Sapphira lost their lives for a little lie. Plus, they were still being generous, right? The problem, if you're taking notes, which is on the back of your program here, is how seriously God takes deception and dishonor. Deception and dishonor. First, deception. The Greek word for kept back in Acts 5.2 uh, can refer to financial fraud. It's the same word used for a guy named Achan, funny name there, in uh, Joshua 7.1. And uh, he, he held and hid the plunder of Jericho, even though God told him uh, not to. Ananias, uh, it's kind of the same thing. He instigates this action, and his wife enables and encourages him in the deception. One commentator says the deceitful act was completely premeditated, apparently motivated by the desire to appear more generous than they truly are. The desire for human praise is more important to them than being faithful to God. So there's deception, but then there's also dishonor. The deception and motivation behind it is deeply dishonoring to God. All right, notice what Peter says to Ananias in verse 3. Why has Satan so filled your heart? Remember a few weeks ago we talked about the Holy Spirit filling us? How the Holy Spirit can control our, our actions and, and, and mold our character? Well, this is the opposite. I'm not exactly sure what it means for Satan to fill your heart, but I, I know this. It's not good. Right? That's not good. It's not possession or indwelling, but probably more like when we say, you know, that person's full of it, right? Carl's full of it, you know? No, you're not. Uh, but uh, but, it, but it, it's like, you know, and, and so Peter substitutes a different S word, Satan, right? This guy is full of Satan, and, and that means that his actions are completely characterized by evil. Are Ananias and Sapphira truly Christians? Hard to say. But there's no reason why they couldn't be. I'm standing for far worse things, right? I'm still here. There's no reason this couldn't happen to any of us. We're all prone to be more concerned about our social status and outward appearance than what 
God thinks about us and to put ourselves above the needs of others. So this deception and this dishonor exhibited by Ananias and Sapphira is serious enough for God to make a point, an example. There's an interesting parallel that Chris uh, pointed out to me, um, and, and that's in Leviticus 10, and this is with two guys named Nadab and Abihu. Cool biblical names today, huh? Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus 10. Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron, each took a censer and put fire in it, laid incense on it, offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said, among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people, I will be glorified. So two priests, early in the Old Testament, they, uh, they disobey God's instructions on proper priestly protocol on how to honor God within that religious system. They play with fire and they get burned. The story resembles Ananias and Sapphira's story in a lot of ways. Right? There's both two people. Both stories in, happen early in the formation of a new community. Both stories involve dishonoring God. Holiness and purity of heart are stressed. And both stories have the same results. Body bags. So lastly, if you're taking notes, what's the purpose? Why did God do this or allow this? Of both stories, Ananias and Sapphira, Nadab and Abihu, what's going on here? If you're taking notes, the purpose is great fear. Verse 5, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Verse 11, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Now, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to know what phobos megas means. Great fear. Is fear a good thing? Sometimes. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. There's healthy kinds of fear. We teach our young children how to have a healthy fear of the street, of other cars, so they hold our hand and look both ways. We want our kids to have a healthy fear of sketchy strangers. Uh, we teach our new drivers and, and new hunters to fear the car, to fear the gun. If there's not a level of fear involved with these things, someone could get killed. The book of Proverbs stresses the most important fear for us to foster, Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if you think that the fear of the Lord might be a bad thing, look what he says in Proverbs 10.27, the fear of the Lord adds length to life. But the years of the wicked are cut short. And as some have argued, if we think the fear of the Lord is just an Old Testament thing, look what it says later on in Acts. Luke says this in 9.31. So the church all throughout Judea, Galilee, Galilee, Samaria, had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. So the fear of the Lord shows up in both Testaments. It's good and healthy for us. And I actually think the fear of the Lord is what can bridge the whole Old Testament God, New Testament God uh, thing together. So we'll define it in a second. But first, three thoughts on why this area of our faith is difficult for us, fearing God. And first is cultural reasons. Culturally, for a number of reasons, we've kind of lost the sense of transcendence, respect, reverence, honor, appreciation, awe. More and more in most environments, our posture is casual, easygoing, informal, nonchalant, lackadaisical. A while ago, my parents had a neighborhood potluck, and I showed up because there was food involved, and, uh, and uh, one of the older neighbors in our neighborhood was lamenting how people don't dress up in church anymore. I was like, oh, well, I mean, okay, I understand what you're, where you're coming from. Where do you go to church? She didn't. <laughs> it's like, oh, all right, you know. You, but, you know, it's just interesting, and I'm not making a moral judgment on this. I mean, look at me, you know. I'm not, I don't even know how to tie a tie. Uh, and I always resented my mom for making me wear pants to church growing up, but... Um, I mean, it's interesting, even funerals and weddings, they're becoming more kind of blasé. Fewer and fewer people are dressing up. Again, not necessarily wrong, it just reflects cultural values. More significantly, we've seen a rise in secularism, right? The removal of anything supernatural from our culture or language. When a strong sense of God is removed from the culture, the individual, me, I become central. The sense that I'm the center of the universe, and we see this all from media, Disney, everything, right? Individualism, 
I'm constantly taught to pursue my dreams no matter what. I'm the main character. Everyone else, including God, takes a supporting role in my life movie. The smartphone exasperates this problem as the whole world is available to me to be scanned, tapped, touched, moved away at my uh, desire. If I don't like someone or something, I could just swipe it away. And then lastly, uh, another culture reason, America, we've talked about this, is formed on kind of an anti-authoritarianism. Anything that looks like hierarchy, authority, power, control, it's viewed with intense suspicions being pulled down. Again, not always bad, but not always good either, especially when it comes to our relationship with God. But this isn't just an American problem. People have always struggled with this. Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Proverbs 3, 7, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. That idea, wise in your own eyes. There's a lot of ways we could define the religious word sin. But one way might be to, be, to, to evaluate everything based on my own flawed eyes. Right? To act in such a way that my eyes run the show instead of God's eyes. Thinking first from my perspective instead of deferring to or fearing his perspective. Lastly, I think there's some important theological reasons that fearing the Lord is difficult. We live in an era, a time that emphasizes God's nearness, his love, his concern, his care, his fatherhood. And that's a good thing. I, I don't know that we can overemphasize these things. We don't worship the God of Benjamin Franklin, the deist who believed that God made the world, but he's off somewhere else, distant from it. No, our God constantly interacts with his creation, loves his creation. Most significantly, when he became human in the person of Jesus. So God did and does come near to us. Emmanuel means God with us. On the other hand, in our day, we have probably underemphasized, no probably about it, God's transcendence, holiness, greatness, power, authority, control. Referring to God as my co-pilot or homeboy seems to really like miss the point, right? I love the tension in the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 9. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, warmth, familiarity. Hallowed be your name. Fear, reverence, respect, awe. In the same sentence. I love how James puts it. James was Jesus' brother. And he starts out his letter, his literal brother, or half-brother, I guess, uh, biologically. Uh, he says this, James a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone had a special familiarity with Jesus, it could have been James. And he could have used it to his own advantage. Like, hey guys, check me out. I was Jesus' brother. Listen to what I have to say. He says, no, I'm, I'm James, a slave of Jesus, a servant. James humbles himself to his older brother, recognizes the greatness of Jesus. In comparison, he's a servant. Well, what is the fear of the Lord? It's actually kind of difficult to translate this idea of phobos in, in, in the scripture, fear, because in scripture it can mean anything from respect to horror. It seems like the word respect might be a little too soft, and horror is probably too strong, so they stuck with the word fear in most cases. The three things that characterize the fear of the Lord. First is acknowledgement, acknowledging who he is. Hebrews 10.31, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. The fear of the Lord simply starts with that acknowledgement that he is God and I am not. He is great, so much beyond what our minds and hearts can comprehend. It's like when I got to visit the Amazon River in, in Peru. I think I got a picture here and a nice little selfie there uh, as well. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Um, but uh, so by some estimations now, the Amazon River is the biggest river in the world, even longer than the Nile by, uh, by uh, National Geographic standards. <clears throat> and uh, when you get a clear view, view of the river, you cannot help but be impressed by how simply massive it is. And similarly, when you get a clear view of God, primarily through scripture, but also through our changed lives, you can't help but be impressed. Next is alignment. Alignment's so crucial in so many areas of our lives, right? From car tires to my back to a well-organized soccer team 
right, to a skyscraper. If pieces or parts are out of position, it's going to be a big problem. If the goalkeeper leaves his position to try to go score a goal, that's not good. Right? The team will fall apart. If my lower vertebrae leaves their position to go hang out with my hands, my back will fall apart. If bricks at the bottom of the skyscraper want to go to the top of the skyscraper, the building will fall apart. So the fear of the Lord then is to recognize our position underneath him. One scholar put it like this, to fear the Lord is to stand in a subservient position to him, to acknowledge one's dependence on him. This posture naturally leads to humility and an avoidance of pride since the one who fears God recognizes that God, not oneself, is the center of the cosmos. Proverbs 2.10, Therefore, you kings, be warned, you rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to destruction for his wrath can flare up at a moment. Bless all who take refuge in him. When we're aligned under the king, we're actually happy. We're safe. We're where we're supposed to be. We're in our position, in our place. When we're outside of that alignment, when we don't fear the Lord, we're in trouble. And so is everyone around us. So is our spouse. So is our family. So is our team. Things are going to crumble if we're out of alignment. And third, the fear of the Lord is this appreciative awe. I think the best word for fear of the Lord, the best synonym is probably awe. A-W-E. Reverence. The Amazon's sheer size and strength simply amazed me. Some people have similar experiences at the Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon. Fearing God means we have an amazement and awe and appreciation for truly how great he is. And no matter your feelings on the current president, I think if he called you up, there would be some sort of fear, awe, reverence, respect. Like, just for the fact that the, maybe not the man himself, but the office, the prestige of the office has, is calling you up. Right? How much more should we be in awe and reverence of the ruler of the cosmos? All right, so what? How can we foster more of this in our lives? More of a healthy fear of the Lord. Three things come to mind. First is to make time for silence, solitude, and removing distractions. All this is in your notes, by the way, so you can uh, take it in and uh, write, write details here. But as Austin mentioned last week, Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. In today's fast-moving world, we have to carve out that time to protect it, to guard it for silence and solitude. Our phones have to be out of the picture. Right, they have to be off or around, out of sight and sound. I truly believe all of us should be taking a day off, a Sabbath. Some of you guys are in disobedience to that now. Or just that day where, you know, I know it's difficult, particularly for stay-at-home moms, small business owners, but we have to try. Truly carve that time out to protect it. Two, we meditate on his attributes. Psalm, uh, Isaiah 66, 2, these are the ones I look on with favor, those who are hum humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Again, Psalm 2, 11, serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Parallel passage in Philippians 2, 12, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it's God who works in you. So in these, the times of silence, maybe in, uh, before your day, maybe before bed, maybe on your lunch break, it's like start to think about his attributes, to meditate on them, his internal existence, his limitless love, infinite wisdom, perfect power, and the list goes on and on. Maybe you make your own list. In three, this one will probably be interesting to you, uh, is to modify your prayer posture. What I mean by this is, um, I, I almost finished this blog post. It should be up by Monday, but it's uh, entitled this, What a Demon and a Muslim Taught Me About Prayer. So hopefully that's good clickbait, you know, hopefully lots of people read it. Um, but, but the idea is, so the demon that I've learned from prayer, you're like, what has our pastor gotten into? <laughs> What's going on? The demon is, who's read the screw tape letters? I C.S. Lewis. Yeah, great book. And, uh, and in that book, uh, this demon named Screwtape is teaching a younger demon how to kind of corrupt his, 
uh, Christian client, you know. Um, and, uh, and so he's teaching the demon Wormwood how to ruin people's lives and relationships with God. And at one point, when talking about prayer, Screwtape says this to uh, Wormwood. He says, yeah, he stresses the need to keep people away from prayer, as you might imagine. But if they do pray, he says, keep it superficial, spontaneous, just in their hearts. Keep it lazy. And then he says this, and this really jumped out at me. Screwtape says, persuade them that the body position makes no difference to their prayers. For they constantly forget what you might always remember, that they are animals. And whatever their bodies do affect their souls, affects their souls. So Lewis, through this fictional demon, uh, shows us that our bodies are important. Our posture is important in prayer. And it's similar to the Islamic prayer practices. Not that I believe what Islam teaches, but I've been really impressed by their prayer postures. They uh, have a, a, a number of, maybe you've seen it in, in movies or, or, or uh, you know, on a TV show or something, when they'll, they'll go into the mosque and they'll, they'll, they'll say, you know, Allah is the greatest. It's all in Arabic, which is interesting. Uh, and then they'll bow down and they'll get on their knees and they'll prostrate themselves, you know, and, and they'll do the, just the, the total sense of posture and, and awe in, in God's presence. They'll say, glorious is my Lord, the most great. Glorious is my Lord, the most great. Glorious is my Lord, the most great. And they'll stand up and say, God hears those who praise him. And I've been really impressed by that posture. Maybe that's why so many Muslims are coming to Christ. Is this sense of fear, awe, and reverence of God and God chooses to reveal himself to them in dreams and through missionaries. Here's what this looked like in my life. For me personally, I'm just trying to get on my knees more when I pray. And that's not because I'm spiritual or a super Christian. It's kind of the opposite, right? It's because in my recliner, my thoughts wander, and pretty soon I'm thinking about Peter Pit. <laughs> but when I'm on my knees, it's more of a discomfort more of a focus, more of a reminder of who I am and who God is. In times of musical worship, like we just had, some of us lift our hands or, or we'll hold our hands out. A posture of reception, like a, a child. Right? Posture matters. So I'm going to invite Matt back up as we uh, con conclude this service but the best summary of all this is by the author of Hebrews, as uh, he often does. In Hebrews 12, 28, he says this, Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. He's using an earthquake metaphor and a fire metaphor to demonstrate that every human kingdom Every human accomplishment will be shaken and consumed. Temporary. It's like sandcastles on the beach. But there is an, a, a permanent kingdom with a permanent king who conquers not by killing, but by being killed. Not by taking life, but by giving his away for you and for me. So this permanent kingdom can only be received. It can't be earned or worked for. It's received only by reverent, thankful faith. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. My life is yours. I trust you, what you did on the cross for me, for the restoration of this world and the restoration of my life. As we close this service, I want to invite you to do something that might be a little uncomfortable, and you don't have to if you're not willing or able, but I want to invite you to, to kneel to kind of set your stuff to the side, to kneel with me. And, and if, you, if you can't or you're not able to, just feel free to just um, bow your head. Um, but, but will you if, you, if you can, take a moment to kneel with me. And I want us to read Psalm 96.4 together. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. One more time. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. Just take a minute or two to spontaneously offer prayers to God as, as they come to mind in your, 
in your heart and in your mind. Father, we're here this morning <clears throat> impressed by who you are. We pray that as we go about our week, Lord, that we might not literally be on our knees, but we'd have that posture of, of submission and service to you and how great you are. Lord, we don't want to be the center of the cosmos. We don't belong there and we're not happy there. So we pray uh, for your exaltation in our lives. We know you are exalted and so we ask that you'd give us that sense, a greater sense in our lives. In Jesus' name.